Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh annual SF Urban Film Fest. My name is Faye Darmawi and I'm the founder and executive director. Our mission is to use the power of storytelling to spark discussion and civic engagement around our most pressing urban issues. And now I'd like to turn it over to Omid Manicheri. Hi, Faye. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Omid Manucheri, and I am one of the program producers here at the SF Urban Film Fest and curator of today's program. Let me start off by saying it's my absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, this festival is a venture that's close to my heart and where I've called my creative and intellectual home for the last five years. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, our, our newest core team member, Crystal. Chelik, um, who is our festival manager and curatorial fellow. Um, to start off, we'd like to offer a land acknowledgement that was gifted to us from the American Indian Cultural District in San Francisco. Uh, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. We are presenting this land acknowledgement to promote visibility for the Ramatush Ohlone and all American Indians living and thriving today on their ancestral homelands. Faye, over to you. Oh, um, the this afternoon's program is a watch party and we will be watching Lewis Mumford's classic film, The City Together. Uh, uh, and throughout the film screening, our panelists, John Moody and David Vega Barashowicz will offer live commentary. We'll begin shortly, but first a few announcements. Um, we're, all used to get, we're all getting used to navigating these virtual events, so unpredictable things may happen. Thanks for your patience. Um, if you have any issues, please leave them a message in the comment box. Um, we also want to alert you that this session is being recorded and we also want to thank all our members today um, and if you'd like to become a member uh, and keep our community growing uh, it's easy to do so via our website um, and if you just as simply like to donate our festival this year is mostly pay what you can so that all can access the programs um, and your donation will offset the sliding scale um, also quickly, we would love for you to fill out a survey um, that uh, we will drop in the comment box. It's important that we get as many survey responses as possible to understand who we are reaching and how we can make sure that we're serving our diverse and wonderful audiences. Thank Back you, to you, Faye. Amin. Yeah, thanks for the reminders, Faye. Um, just a little bit about this program before we get started. Uh, the city, oh man. Do I have a lot to say about that? Um, but out of respect for everyone's time and honestly, my own naivete, I'll leave that discussion to our distinguished panelists. I will say that when it comes to this 1939 film, I was immediately enthralled and left wondering how much of what is in this film was actually realized and how much failed and why. Partially due to its aesthetic and partially due to its implications in the arc of modern urban planning. So without further ado, and thank you for bearing with me, it's my pleasure to introduce our two panelists today. Uh, John Moody is a creative director and urban designer. Uh, he's worked in Hollywood as a cinematographer and then decided to get in the urban planning field with, uh, by pursuing a degree. Uh, and we've also screened a few of his films here at the film festival one of which was based uh, in the city of Melbourne and the other about Pershing Square in Los Angeles. Uh, joining John will be David Vega Barakowitz, 
and he is the director of urban design at WXY Architecture and Urban Design and an adjunct professor of planning and urban design at Syracuse University. Um, throughout this watch party, please uh, submit any questions, comments you might have uh, in the chat functions on both YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we'll, we'll be addressing them both during the, the program and afterwards uh, at the Q&A. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna again thank Faye. Faye, thank you for, for doing all this and bringing us all together and bring on John. Hey, John and David. Hi, guys. Thanks so much hey. for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. David, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Omid. Thanks, Faye. And uh, really excited to have uh, the opportunity to uh, share this film with everyone and to, to introduce those who haven't seen it uh, to the city, uh, which is really a, a, a kind of fantastic um, and uh, really, really uh, important milestone, uh, not only as a sort of reflection of larger planning themes and ideas in that sort of late depression, early World War II era, uh, but also a really amazing um, uh, kind of moment in the history of film. Um, so I, I wanted to just take a little bit of time just to kind of quickly position the film in terms of where it sits in the larger history of urban planning and urban design, which is really um, the way in which I watch this. Uh, and then John will kind of do the same for planning. Um, the film uh, is released in 1939. Uh, it, it, it comes out uh, at the, as, as part of a larger exhibition called The City of Tomorrow um, or Democracy at the 1939 World's Fair in New York, which is sort of the, the fair of the future. It's sort of this incredible um, expression of hope and optimism for a different kind of world uh, as Americans are leaving the depression and mobilizing for World War II. Um, the, the film um, I think is often read uh, as a kind of propaganda film for post-war suburbanization that accelerated after the 1950s. But in, in reality, uh, it's a much more complicated story. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, the, the film was part of uh, the Democracy exhibition at 19, in, in the 1939 fair. There's another diorama and another exhi exhibit, uh, Futurama by Norman Bel Geddes, that I think ends up um, be, having a much larger kind of role and a, a, a much longer shadow in terms of how, uh, how people think of the fair and its, its memory. And I think that's important, uh, the kind of um, uh, difference between government um, sponsored revitalization versus um, private sector revitalization. The film itself was originally the idea of Catherine Bauer, who uh, was a well-known housing advocate, uh, an advocate for modern housing, uh, was really the force uh, behind the initial uh, federal intervention into housing policy in the Housing Acts of 1934 and 1937. Uh, but she was also part of a larger group of urban planners and kind of visionary thinkers in the 1920s called the Regional Planning Association of America, uh, of which um, members included Lewis Mumford, uh, Benton Mackay, who's well known as the sort of originator and the spirit behind the Appalachian Trail, uh, Frederick Ackerman, uh, and Clarence Stein, among others. Uh, this is a group that originated in the early 1920s and was heavily influenced by a Scottish, kind of eccentric Scottish town planner by the name of Patrick Geddes, who really had um, a, a kind of idea of uh, regional planning that was based on the alignment between uh, cultural values, livelihood, production, and place, and is sort of best known for what's, what's called the, um, uh, the valley section, where he sort of related uh, the sort of uh, hinterland, the river valleys, uh, to the mouths, to the great cities um, that uh, that digested uh, their 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 uh, their labor and their production. Um, Mumford uh, ended up sort of taking Getty's vision, translating it to the United States, and offered a vision of regionalism that's a lot different from the one that um, that we kind of typically think of today, which was advanced by the Regional Plan Association of New York City. Uh, and one of the important themes that we'll see both in the film 
uh, and and uh, and hopefully in the conversation that follows, is the difference between a, a, a vision of regionalism that sought to think about the distribution of wealth and resources to uh, rural parts of the country, sort of thinking about uh, the outlying centers of production um, throughout the country uh, and, and the kind of great cities, the, the cities that were exhausting resources and exhausting people. Um, you know, during the 1930s, a lot of the, the visionary ideas of the 19, uh, of the RPAA in the 1920s ended up actually being partially realized. And in many ways, this film is a celebration uh, of those accomplishments and a look toward the future. But the film um, is also important for what didn't happen. Uh, and I think one of the things that we'll talk about and we'll see throughout this film is that the vision of planning um, that's advanced is one uh, in which uh, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, extent of uh, government intervention, of federal vision for what planning should be in the future that we continue to see unrealized uh, and a political current, um, which in many ways uh, continues to have echoes today, um, but doesn't la doesn't have the same sort of power and influence that it did in the 1930s. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to John Moody, uh, who's gonna be my uh, partner in this commentary. Thank you, Dave. Um, so what I'll be looking at this film from is more of a perspective of the evolution of film and film technology. The uh, probably most important figure in that world behind this film is Par Lorenz, who was really known as like FDR's filmmaker. Um, he was responsible for a couple of these big documentaries during the 1930s. Um, first, The Plow That Broke the Plains, and then second, The, uh, the River, both produced under the office of, um, I think it was like the, the US Film Office or the US Film something or other. But this was a government program um, kind of sponsored by the Resettlement, administ or Resettlement um, Administration to educate people about the New Deal and what was going on in terms of trying to you know, find new places for people to live. Um, and new industry and how we're reshuffling, uh, you know, the nation to get everybody back to work. Um, he didn't direct this film, and that's partly probably because the um, film office was dissolved in 1938 when Congress flipped uh, to be more conservative. And uh, regardless, he kind of functioned as the executive producer and wrote the original outline, but. He brought in two um, people that had worked as cinematographers on those previous films to direct this. And I think the really interesting thing about these, this group of people is they're coming from a tradition that we could kind of loosely characterize as the first generation of American avant-garde filmmakers. Um, and they were pulling ideas quite directly from what was happening in Soviet film at the same time, or just in the previous decade, in the 1920s, um, that was kind of in like opposition to what was going on in Hollywood, especially, but also in other areas of documentary film that sort of started with Nanak of the North in 1922, of this more theatrical, staged, um, you know, kind of traditions coming from uh, theater and from literature. And they were sort of saying, just like a lot of photographers were, like Ansel Adams and Ed Weston were saying, that we need to you know, channel film in a direction that takes advantage of the technology and what it can do that no other medium can do. And that's why they were looking at the Soviet filmmakers like Ziga Vertov to say, wow, these guys are really you know, promoting new ideas and able to affect audiences in new ways through the way that they film something and also the way that they edit the film. So I think that's something that um, it would be great for the audience today to really start looking at you know, similarities. How are they using editing to try to get across ideas that wouldn't be present if you just saw, say, one of those shots by themselves? Um, the parallel to planning and modernism that I think 
uh, I would love to talk about with everybody is, you know, that film is sort of taking itself or these guys and a lot of these um, avant-garde folks are taking film in the direction of how can we use technology to sort of break free of these more oppressive kind of capitalist um, kind of capitalist uh, conventions to create um, something that we've never seen before. And I mean, the interesting thing about a lot of the folks that were involved in the film, Leo Hurwitz um, being the person that kind of brought the two directors together originally uh, in a film and photo league in the early thirties and um, Par Lorenz and uh, actually not Par Lorenz, but several other people in, involved in the film later became uh, blacklisted uh, in the early 1950s uh, by the House on American Activities Committee. So it'd be great to you know take a look at the film in light of these kinds of developments and thinking about it as it relates to the development of cities. So I'm pretty excited uh, to look at it this way and um, excited to hear what everybody says during the film and the chats. And David and I will be commenting on the film uh, but we'll also open it up for Q&A at the end. So I think without further ado, does everybody feel ready to start the film? So you can see that the film really opens up on this kind of pastoral vision uh, of, of, of the country and the scenes. Um, and uh, these are actually largely scenes that were shot in Shirley, Massachusetts. And Shirley, Massachusetts was where Benton Mackay uh, used to spend his summers and really actually developed his kind of love of small towns and regions. Uh, of around the country. Good to note that water power will be a theme throughout the film. Yeah, and there was a there was a film um, called The River that was um, about the Tennessee Valley Authority. That sort of was a one of the key precursors to this um, water power and the sort of early grist mills and industrial production of the small towns was sort of frequently lamented as something lost by the regional planners. Um, and part of their vision for sort of creating new communities uh, well beyond the sort of large central cities of the country. And there's Shirley, Massachusetts, um, referenced in, in honor of Benton Mackay's impact on the, the, the kind of valley civilization view of urban planning.
So one thing to note about these kinds of scenes is you would see as a tradition in the Kino Pravda films of the Soviets and also, um, you know, other of these types of um, sort of straight documentaries that they're not using actors. These are real people in real places. Whereas I think the Hollywood tradition would definitely try to craft something that's a lot more theatrical. Obviously, they were probably directing these actors or these people to do things. But not foreign to what they would normally do. A century or two ago, we built our church and mocked the common out. We raised the town hall next so we could have our say about the taxes or whether we need another teacher for the school. When town meeting comes around, we know our rights and duties, and no harm if we disagree. In all that matters, we neighbors hold together. We work from sun to dark, if you can call just work a job that helps make a body feel at peace while doing it, or hum a bit with pleasure when it's done. Art isn't something foreign we look at in a showcase. It's in the blankets that we've spun and woven right at home. It's in the patchwork quilt sewn by our daughters at a quilting bee for someone's bridal chest. It's in the locks and hinges that the blacksmith shapes. It's in the baskets that are woven in the neighborhood to fit our household needs from marketing to mending. When water wheels are better fitted to do the work than human hands, we rig up the machines to saw the wood or grind the corn for hominy grits and johnny cake. A while ago, that corn was on the stalk above the pumpkins, ripe and yellow. One night, the neighbors met to shell the ears together. They did the job in no time, so they could clear the old barn floor and choose their favorite partners for the dances. There was lasting harmony between the soil and what we built or planted there. We used our hands and mastered what we laid our hands on. Working and living, we found a balance. The town was us, and we were part of it. We never let our cities grow too big for us to manage. We never pushed the open land too far away. We youngsters took it in. The haying field, the mill, the daily chores were teachers. We old ones had good years of family life, our own, our children's. Mellow years before the ripe fruit fell, as fruit will drop on windless autumn days. And that was peace. The seed was ready for the earth again, ready to die, ready once more to grow. You can see in that last scene that there are a couple of important themes that emerge. One of the big ones uh, is this idea that, you know, this isn't a sort of vision of deindustrialization. It's much more a vision of early industrialization and periods in American history in the uh, early to mid 19th century in which there was really uh, more of a balance between urban and rural areas. Um, and so, you know, it's a nostalgic vision, but it's one that's, um, you know, much, oh, sorry. Forget the quiet cities, bring in the steam and steel, the iron men, the giants, open the throttle, all aboard the promised land. Pillars of smoke by day, pillars of fire by night, pillars of progress. Machines to make machines, production to expand production. There's wood and wheat and kitchen sinks and calico, all ready made in tons and carload lots, enough for tens, thousands, millions, millions, faster and faster, better and better. So, interesting to note the uh, tonal shift there. We went from basically this kind of paradise lost epitaph to um, more of like a industry sales pitch. These are views of Pittsburgh and Homestead. Pittsburgh Don't was... make us any happier to know there's millions like us living here on top of it. Prisons where a guy sent up for crime can get a better place to live in than we can give our children. Smoke makes prosperity, they tell you here. Smoke makes prosperity, no matter if you choke on it. 
We got to face life in these shacks and alleys. We got to let our children take their chances here with rickets, typhoid, TB, or worse. They draw a blank, the kids. They have no business here, this no man's land, this slag heap wasn't meant for them. There's poison in the air we breathe, there's poison in the river. The fog and smoke below rise up and choke us. Carnegie Foundation was one of the main funders of the film. Their Pittsburgh had been a subject of a famous survey of public health uh, in, in early in, in the 19th, uh, 20th century, 1907. Don't tell us that this is the best that you can do in building cities. Who built this place? What put us here? And how do we get out again? We're asking, just asking. We might as well stay in the mills and call that home. They're just as fit to live in. We mine the coal, load the furnace, roll the steel, drive the rivets. We lock the bolt on the assembly line. Lucky if we have the chance to keep the job from day to day, from month to month. These kind of images of what was, you know, officially called blight uh, were, you know, common in planning reports running all the way from, you know, 1900 all the way through 1960 and even the early 1970s. Tended to focus on lack of areas for children playing, be paired with um, illustrations of public health, typhoid cases, um, uh, influenza. Uh, and so in, in, in many ways, sort of showing the foundation of urban planning alone, and public health. Down. We're not ashamed to handle coal and iron all the way from mine shafts to skyscrapers. We turn out cars, attractors we're mighty proud of, same as you. But how does that make sense with this? We never get the gritty feel out of our nose, our eyes, our lungs, our guts. We never get a chance to see how blue the sky can be unless the mills are all shut down. Smoke makes prosperity, they say. Does this mean that there's no way out for us? There must be something better. Why can't we have it? A decent home. It's interesting to note that about two years later, Pittsburgh passed landmark legislation um, following in the footsteps of St. Louis to actually limit the amount of smog um, in, in, in the city, sort of a precursor to, you know, large scale national environmental policy changes. But at the time was, you know, Follow a the city crowd. that- Get the big money. You make a pile and raise a pile. That makes another pile for you. Follow the crowd. We've reached a million, two million, five million. Watch us grow, going up. It's new, it's automatic, it dictates, records, seals, sterilizes, stamps, and delivers in one operation without human hand. What am I bid? What am I offered? Sold. Who's next? The people, yes. Follow the crowd to the Empire City, the Wonder City, the Windy City, the Fan City. The people, yes. The people, perhaps. Beg to remain yours most respectful. Dear sir, we gentlemen, to acknowledge yes, having heard sir. yours from the yes, sir. 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 Yes, A lot of these scenes, uh, not coincidentally, bear pretty striking resemblance to um, photographs that were taken of Manhattan in the early uh, 1900s. One in particular that people should look up is Wall Street by Paul Strand, taken in 1915, which was kind of a, a, a great photographic commentary on modernism and um, capitalism. One of the kind of persistent themes in the film is 
the role of cars and traffic safety in particular as it relates to children. Um, so if you, somebody that works in transportation planning, thinking about vision zero efforts, this is definitely a kind of moment in, 19, in the 1920s when there's a public outcry over the rise in traffic fatalities. There's a, a great book by Peter Norton um, about, um, about uh, the sort of lost story of outcry over uh, traffic fatalities in American cities. And uh, it's worth also noting that the various images of children at play, there's a good film called In the Street that was done by Helen Levitt um, that kind of contrasts with this, which is looking at it um, in the early 1940s, uh, looking at children playing in the street as sort of an early example of um, kind of cities for people, the kind of Jane Jacobs vision of the city. And so these two visions here kind of collide, one of blight, one of play uh, and uh, kind of successful urbanity. If anybody who's watching hasn't seen Man with a Movie Camera, that's a, a must-see for anybody. But you can tell a lot of the editing techniques and the kind of frenetic pacing. All of those things weren't happening at once, but through editing, they were made to seem like they were all happening at once. And I think a really important theme here is the music, everything about this is trying to convey, a, trying to play to a certain um, sensibility that the audience already maybe had about the city, about how dangerous it was. But if you were to play this 20 or 30 years later, people might have a much different kind of viewpoint. The beauty in the, is in the eye of the, the beholder. Um, you know, and Jane Jacobs in 1960 was talking about how a lot of these urban environments, not necessarily the these downtown ones, but lots of people on the street, different types of um, transportation, lots of activities happening all at once in one place was actually a very beautiful thing that suburbanization started to destroy. Yeah. The view that you just saw was of the garment district in New York City, which is kind of frequently a one of the places that was congested that they were calling for reform in the way that they managed loading and um, kind of curbside uh, regulations in cities. So uh, continues to actually, you know, be an issue of study and topic of conversation around sort of growing on-demand deliveries today. And so very much uh, a kind of current theme in terms of the way that they were beginning to think about it and look at it. Um, this is sort of also New York, um, at a time when they were just building or just finishing many of the uh, many of the tunnels that would cross into New Jersey, and so there was um, kind of limitless congestion in the, the lower parts of Manhattan and Midtown. And these these shots are really key for conveying this sense of anonymity, how the individual is essentially lost. The, the film Koyana Skatsi, by, uh, which was done by, with Philip Glass, um, is a, a, a kind of interesting later 
um, film that was clearly at least somewhat inspired by this series of scenes. And perhaps another thing that, that's worth noting is this kind of sense that we haven't seen narration in, or haven't heard narration in quite a while. Um, we're kind of just doing this, this tour throughout the city, gathering impressions. And this is a technique that was used later very frequently by um, a lot of the kind of second generation of avant-garde filmmakers. Guy Debord uh, of the Situationists, um, you know, used this technique quite a bit. One thing to note in the last scene, and John pointed this out, of the, the skyscrapers sort of dwarfing the church uh, in Lower Manhattan, and sort of direct contrast to the earlier scene where the church is the church common is sort of the center of American life. In 1939, just for perspective, um, sort of in, in the middle of the regional Parkway building era in New York, but well before the interstate highway system um, started being built in earnest in 1950s. So it's an era in which people are moving out to Long Island, uh, up to Westchester and into the suburbs of New Jersey, but there isn't necessarily the infrastructure uh, to, to really support that. visions of kind of, you can see this sort of me mechanistic policeman, traffic accidents, again, sort of playing an, a role here. Um, David, here's a question from Hannah Moore. She's asking, why is there such a focus on motor vehicles instead of public transportation? In the 1920s and 30s, car ownership uh, grew exponentially and there was a widespread belief that population would deconcentrate over time partially made sort of facilitated by you know personal car ownership becoming prevalent and so uh, this is also an era in which many of the trolley cars began being converted to buses um, and when there was a widespread belief that the population would suburbanize um, the nature of that suburbanization is at issue in this film. The car goes off the edge. <laughs> like we've gone, we've gone too far. Sort of reminiscent of the Tennessee Valley Authority, large-scale public works, um, themes, industrialization, what, what Lewis Mumford referred to as the building of a, a neo-technic civilization facilitated by changes in technology. Science takes flight at last for human goals. This new age builds a better kind of city, close to the soil once more, as molded to our human wants as planes are shaped for speed. New cities take form, green cities. They're built into the countryside. They're ringed with trees and fields and gardens. New cities are not allowed to grow and overcrowd beyond the size that makes them fit for living in. The new city is organized to make cooperation possible between machines and men and nature. Each has his place. The sun and air and open green are part of the design. Safe streets and quiet neighborhoods are not just matters of good luck. They're built into the pattern and built to stay there. Power flashes from pitheads or rapid streams across the region. It flows from powerhouses to the sunlit factories and laboratories. Here, science serves the worker and the work together, making machines more automatic and the men who govern them more human. Factories are set apart from living quarters, but close to rail and motor roads, with space to spread about in. Light industries are near at hand. The heavy ones are set apart. People can even walk to work and have their lunch at home sometimes, just like the kids. This is no suburb where the lucky people play at living in the country. This kind of city spells cooperation, 
were ever doing things together means cheapness or efficiency or better living each house is grouped with other houses close to the school the public meeting hall the movies and the market around these green communities a belt of public land preserves their shape forever the children need the earth for playing and growing bringing the city into the country bringing the parks and gardens back into the city never letting cities grow too big to manage never pushing the meadows fields and woods too far away this works as well for modern living as once it did in old new england town One of the important things that you see there is emphasis on grade separation, sort of allowing children and bicycles to sort of path underneath ro pass underneath roads, something that was originally introduced in, um, in Central Park, actually. Um, we're seeing images here of two new towns. Uh, the first, uh, Radburn in New Jersey, it was built in 1928 um, by the City Housing Corporation. And uh, the Greenbelt, uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, a new town that was uh, built in uh, opened in 1937, built uh, under the Resettlement Administration's Greenbelt New Towns program. Um, the Greenbelt uh, New Town and Radburn New Town both had uh, a, a component which was kind of really going beyond housing and thinking about uh, the role of work and actually bringing factories and, and jobs uh, into uh, rural and kind of what we see as suburban areas today. This was not a conventional suburb. Uh, this, these are areas that had a variety of different types of housing that they offered, including townhomes, uh, smaller detached homes and apartments. Uh, and so they're, they're more traditionally what we would see as planned unit developments today. Uh, they also offered um, a fair amount of emphasis on recreation and the centrality of schools and civic facilities um, as sort of the uh, as, as sort of the heart of their communities. It, another thing that never really came to fruition uh, in in suburban areas across the country. Um, and there's a focus again um, on the sort of the role of the child, the role of play. Um, and uh, it, it, the ability for play and work to kind of coexist in these environments uh, in a way that it was, uh, wasn't was able to in the kind of dense cities of, uh, of the Northeast that they showed earlier in the film. So a really important question that everybody in the audience should be asking themselves is who is in this picture and who is missing? You know, and who is this a vision for? It's worth noting Green Greenbelt was segregated until the 1960s. We live a decent kind of life. We fathers have a little time to watch our kids and play with them. They see us in the daytime. The people who laid out this place didn't forget that air and sun are what we need for growing, whether it's flowers or babies. Just watch us grow. The scales won't hold us soon. You can't tell where the playing ends and where the work begins. We mix them here. We learn by living. Playgrounds, schools, libraries are meant for everyone. Even the washing needn't break a woman's back. Machines can take it. And the wife needn't feel cooped up and lonely on washing day. A little gossip or a friendly hand is good for the complexion. The daily marketing's part of the fun. In fact, the market's just an annex to the kitchen. Another chance to chat about the children's measles or the weather, or some new wrinkle in the diet that grandma never knew. One thing is sure. Most of the greens brought in by truck from nearby farms each morning are fresh and crisp and haven't lost their flavor or their youth. In this new scheme of things, the school becomes the center and the focus of activities. Here boys and girls live and relive the life around them, getting the measure of our bigger world and shaping it anew. City and school and land in active partnership 
provide the raw materials for life and growth. Here, boys and girls achieve a balanced personality, ready to build and meet a many-sided world, facing the good and bad, choosing the best. It's important to note, in contrast to what we know about suburban communities, is that we aren't really seeing any single family homes in this vision, um, except in these pictures that this kid is drawing, but they're mostly townhomes. like the house on Haunted Hill type feel of some of these. You take your choice. Each one is real, each one is possible. Shall we sink deeper, sink deeper in old grooves, paying for blight with human misery? Or have we vision, have we courage? Shall we build and rebuild our cities, clean again, close to the earth, open to the sky? Can we afford a house, a neighborhood, a city as good as this for everyone? Maybe the question is, can we afford all this disorder? The hospitals, the jails, reformatories, the wasted years of childhood. These are future citizens, voters, lawmakers, mothers, fathers. You take your choice. Each one is real, each one is possible. Order has come, order and life together. We've got the skill, we've found the way. We've built the cities. All that we know about machines and soils and raw materials and human ways of living is waiting. We can reproduce the pattern and better it a thousand times. It's here, the new city, ready to serve a better age. You and your children, the choice is yours. begun the sort of scene of water power, sort of large scale industry in contrast to sort of the smaller scale grist mill at the beginning. Airplanes, water, children, the future of America. Excellent. Um, well, we have a couple of questions to frame the discussion, um, but we'll also be replying to uh, any questions that come through in the comments. So, I wonder if, and maybe Omi, do you want to join us? Sure. To kind of filter some of these? Yeah. You guys, that was awesome. The commentary was, I mean, I've seen this film a few times and that just, you know, first of all, it blew my mind and then it took it to the next level. So, so thank you both for that. Um, thank you. Maybe I can pose these questions to the audience, the ones that you guys had suggested. Uh, this first one is, you know, how did this vision shape or not shape post-war cities and regions in the U.S.? Um, you also wanted to ask people, you know, how is this relevant to cities today? Uh, what parts are we seeing? Uh, what parts kind of got left out? Um, and for our audience, can you think of any other examples of films uh, that tried to change the world uh, via changing the collective conscience of the audience? Um, and this, this has got to be my favorite question. Is there a particular shot or scene or quote that stood out to you? Uh, I know for me, I like the, the diner setting, that kind of fast cutting, uh, it made me feel the automat. Uh, but then there's also that one line where it's like, the guy's like counting the seconds, but losing the days or something. And I, 
Uh, and I also liked, uh, you know, Smoke is Good. Steam is pro Smoke is Progress. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's see what our, our audience has for us. Uh, do, do, do we, we kind of, oh, did we answer the why is there focus on motor vehicles? We did, right? Yeah. Here's a good one. Why are play and blight juxtaposed as devices uh, to incite change? I can sort of start on this one a little bit. I, I mean, one of the, the there are there are a few different ways of looking at this. W one of them is that um, planning around children and sort of children at play, the sort of emerging idea of um, environments uh, envir and environmental change is having sort of a, a, a critical influence on the way that people grow up, the way that people, you know, sort of understand and ref reflect their society was, was something that was emerging at, at the same time. Um, and early urban planning had a tremendous amount of emphasis on uh, sort of the proximity of playgrounds and schools to neighborhoods, understanding these as sort of critical facilities um, that were really anchoring uh, their surrounding institutions and populations. The, the other major uh, driver there is definitely around uh, the, the growth of automobiles. And so um, children playing in the street uh, became something that was viscerally felt um, through automobile accidents rising in the 1920s and 1930s. And there was a, an outcry and a call um, you know, not just to introduce new traffic laws and, you know, impose speed limits and even speed governors, uh, limiting people to, you know, max 20 miles an hour, in some cases, 25 miles an hour, um, but actually to really redesign and rethink roads to allow for streets to become for people again. And so this, this sort of ended up taking two different routes. One was in the direction of building entire new communities that were sort of conceived around uh, the automobile as a reality. And so Radburn, which is shown at the end, was one of the first communities that had cul-de-sacs, for instance. Um, and then on the other hand, really rethinking cities. And so this is where we see, um, you know, the growth in the 1930s, but, you know, largely after Title I in 1949 uh, of slum clearance, of super blocks, of buildings that incorporated housing, uh, sorry, incorporated parking uh, within them. Um, of changes in circulation to ensure safety and to avoid as many conflicts. And so this is uh, sort of part of the birth of modern traffic engineering at the same time. It's the sort of birth of a certain kind of suburbanization. You know, uh, just to stay on the automobile point, I, there was a really pretty funny comment. I thought um, Donald says, uh, keep in mind that the automobile was seen as a solution to pollution by eliminating dependence on horses and their droppings, a major health hazard. Uh, is there is there truth to that? Is that was that really kind of how they were pushing it back then? Well, there was certainly a, it's a great comment. Uh, <laughs> certainly the um, you know, the automobile wasn't seen in the way that it is today is sort of the main contributor to large scale pollution. Definitely the, you know, coal producing factories in Pittsburgh were much more, um, uh, much more present in terms of the in immediate impact in terms of pollution and air quality. The automobile was certainly an offender, but not, not, not the way that it's seen today. Um, and the other thing, you know, that, that the automobile, it, facilitated was access to the outdoors and access to to nature and so it was sort of seen as part of a larger solution certainly um you know shifting away from horses um was part of the larger um modernization and sort of public health reform movement is the other piece you know horses often were you know died in the streets uh, there are these you know, terrible photos of you know horses in cities in 1920s just lying in the middle of streets at new york city um so it's, it's certainly an experience that we don't have today in an age when you know automobiles are definitely seen as kind of gas guzzling vehicles that wasn't wasn't quite the mood although they they were associated with joy riders and you know um people that uh you know, weren't necessarily responsible in the way that they use them in cities. 
Uh, I'm going to, I want to turn these questions on around and, and ask them to you guys. Um, and maybe John, this one's for you. Uh, was there a shot or a scene that, or quote that, that stood out to you and, and why? I think the, the stuff that really stands out to me is how the perspective shifts in the narration. And I mean, I have a couple examples of this, but how it goes from, you know, at first, uh, kind of, um, you know, nostalgic epitaph for the agrarian city or town to the sales pitch and then kind of to like an auctioneer speech and then later um, turns into ultimately this sort of utopian piece. And I mean, it's very interesting the kind of perspectives that it aligns itself with and the perspectives that it sort of dismisses. Um, I mean, maybe probably the most striking moment in the whole film to me is also the only moment that I can tell that we clearly see a person of color. Um, and that's when it takes on the perspective of the workers. It's almost like a union speech that's been made into like a bedtime story. You know, these are our questions. We're just asking why, why, you know, why does the worker have to be left up to this? This is close to the beginning of the film, like around eight, 10 minutes or so. Um, once we transition into the, um, the industrial um, city. And uh, I mean, it's interesting, you, you know, how political this film is, that it's, that it's sort of a, a kind of difference in the potential for, uh, Ro James Rojas was talking in the comments about memories and relationships that we know are in the city, but they were essentially dismissing the existence of them in favor of talking about it more as, uh, you know, this anonymous mass. Um, and that the you know, rural tight knit community can bring back this sense of intimacy and in interpersonal relationships and also a sense of community. It's like the city gets rid of both community and the individual is what they're trying to say, which, you know, at that, at that time was, probably a very progressive thing to say, especially from the perspective of people that wanted to um, promote regionalism. But, uh, you know, take it into another context and, you know, it's, it's, it's very manipulative. So. Well, we've got some, some new questions funneling in. Um, well, first let's start with, we have a, an audience member who responded to how this vision is relevant to cities today. They said, it seems to me that there's no real vision for cities today or urban planners today. Um, no visionary urban planners today, excuse me. Instead, the visions come from corporations and other tech companies. Um, do you guys feel like that's true? Is is the influence of capital and, and business kind of pushing out the our ideals and, and what we want to strive, strive towards? Yeah, well, I mean, this is a great comment and question and has, I think, a, it refracts in a lot of different ways. And certainly the, the visionaries are out there. Um, where they are, how relevant their vision is, and whether that vision is spatial or sort of more policy-oriented are all important questions. And you know, I kind of mentioned early at the beginning that at the 1939 World's Fair, there were... Um, sort of two dioramas. There was democracy, which was, you know, uh, put forward and produced in cooperation with the American Institute of Planners. And then there was Futurama, which was produced by General Motors. And General Motors, Futurama is better remembered today. Um, and, and certainly, you know, it, it goes without saying that technology companies, large scale companies have always played a, a big role um, in uh, sort of helping to tell the story of the future and Google sidewalk labs and Amazon um, among many others are no different. And certainly, you know, there was a exhibit that Ford did about three or four years ago called the future of tomorrow, which seemed to recycle a lot of themes and, you know, images from, from this film. I mean, it, it goes without saying though, that this is an era in which planners planning and government intervention in sort of the, the daily lives and structure of our built environment is far greater than it is today. Um, the, the idea that we had a resettlement administration um, 
that was creating new towns, um, something that, you know, we do see in other countries uh, in, in Europe, but then also uh, in the Soviet Union and China in terms of population movement, um, that, uh, that, that never became part of the fabric of American life. And it, it, it manifested itself um, more through, uh, through favorable lending policies and um, through, uh, uh, you know, essentially subsidies on suburbanization more than it did in sort of forceful, you know, government oriented uh, new town building, uh, which, you know, while interesting and attractive in the way that it shows the film, uh, was, was certainly flawed from, in terms of the finan the, the fin financing perspective of it, you know, Radburn, for instance, one of the ones that was shown was, was never really viable as a, um, as a, a kind of financial venture and, um, Greenbelt Newtown program was essentially canceled in 1937. Uh, even though it's sort of the main subject of the film. Um, I think that the larger lesson um, in terms of its relevance today is is around this idea of regionalism versus metropolitanism. And uh, how do we understand and think about the development of rural areas in uh, contrast to urban areas? You think about the Rural Electric uh, Electrification Administration, the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, you know, these were places, these were administrations, these were government programs that were targeted at uh, really creating jobs, workforce, and creating viable regions in places that are still economically suffering today, whether that's, uh, you know, in, in West Virginia or Tennessee or um, in the Midwest. Uh, and in, in reality, um, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, a need for renewed focus on um, on that balance, and a need to think about how we can, um, uh, you know, th expand things like broadband access across the country, and come up with similarly ambitious programs. Uh, obviously, uh, programs that are uh, free of some of the the biases that you know clearly um, were were sort of um, in, in embedded in these this film and its production. Uh I want to be cognizant of your guys' time. I know, John, you said in the chat you can hang for a little bit longer. David, do you have a few more minutes? There's a, a couple of good questions, I think, that are worth getting to if you if you have the time. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around. Thank you. Um, there, so right off of that point you just made, and this question is probably more suited towards John. John, do you think you, we could make a film like The City today? Do you think we could actually kind of galvanize people in that way um is there a role for films like this today <laughs> oh this is a question that actually david and i have been chewing on for the last five or six years um you know just like what has happened with planning um there really are fewer examples and instances of this kind of large scale movement or i don't want to say movement but kind of like a, a large-scale production to try to convince people of a utopian vision um it happens more sporadically and it happens in more like corporate contexts uh you know where um a company is trying to sell a particular product and they'll use utopian sort of visions as a way to sell that product um you know and i i also I, I, I find it not doubtful, but I find it just, it's got to be, it requires, you know, a lot of capital and a lot of investment on the part of um, individuals to say that we're going to create a film experience that is directly trying to influence the way that people live rather than indirectly. And because films will do this all the time, you know, to try to suggest that maybe we should be living one way or another, but not as part of a program that is actively as its end goal, trying to get people to adopt a new way of life. So anyway, the Carnegie foundation was really the, the main financier of this effort and uh, foundations 
certainly have a role in um, lots of films today, but they don't, and, and, sorry, in lots of like uh, promotional and propaganda films today. Um, but they're often to deal, dealing with like more of these kind of abstract social issues and not dealing, almost never dealing with trying to, you know, redesign something spatially or affect the physical world. And maybe the audience has some examples that um, contradict that. I'd love to hear it. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's also just important to remember the context in which the film was shown, right? It wasn't, you know, this isn't an era in which people have are just able to watch the city on their iPhones or something like people had to go to the fair of the future and were ready to digest and, you know, understand what that future might look like. And this was in part trying to celebrate that vision of what that, uh, what, what that would be based on things that already been built, but also, um, you know, appealing to their, uh, you know, their, their, their political direction. You know, this is a, a time in American history when uh, certainly the influence of communism was, uh, you know, still very much present and the New Deal had, uh, had shifted that balance in its later years. But, um, you know, clearly there's energy and enthusiasm around large scale housing efforts that ended up coming to fruition in the late 40s uh, with, you know, the Housing Act of 1949. So this was an appeal in many ways to, for, to people to support that. Yeah, and I, I mean, well, just quickly echoing what David was saying about, you know, is the 30 minute or the hour or feature length film really the best medium for trying to you know, get people on board with an idea like this. And then you also have to sort of look at, at this, you know, film as, and evaluate whether it worked or not, because it was very effective, I think, at convincing audiences of something. But history then took a different course. And we didn't end up with many of these kinds of communities. We ended up with mass suburbanization. Um, and creating wealth in America for, for white middle-class Americans through the single family home, home ownership. And um, today, I think there are lots of opportunities for campaigns, which might involve smaller media um, and more kind of like incremental forms of engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, John, you're so you're so right. I, I mean, I think like just a recent example. I mean, certainly in California, the um, Anthony Ween, uh, um, gosh, I, I think uh, the Scott Weiner, sorry, <laughs> uh, Scott Weiner's uh, bill, um, uh, housing bill, has been you know a source of perennial debate. But you know, I can see the role of film or media playing a you know a critical. Uh, critical role in something like the the campaign that was successfully launched in Minneapolis to change the zoning code to allow uh, essentially outlaw single family zoning. I mean, there there's certainly a role for reaching people to vote on these kind of issues um, today. Uh, not to say that it's it's this sort of heavily spatial kind of vision of the built environment, but at the very least to begin to chip away at, uh, you know, things like the, the highways that could, you know, be removed or converted to regular streets or um, actually beginning to kind of redress some of the kind of heavily spatial solutions that ended up being enacted in the 1950s and 60s and replacing those with things that, uh, you know, do recognize the kind of um, thing that's largely missing uh, in in this film, which is the uh, the kind of culture of the street, the idea of neighborhoods, the uh, importance of relationships, the, the 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 way in which this film and and the sort of images of blight ended up being turned on their heads in the nineteen uh, late nineteen fifties and sixties by Jane Jacobs and others. Awesome, um, thank you guys so much. There's some great questions in uh, comments and questions in the the chat, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to answer them. Um, but that to that effect, I would like to encourage our our audience to connect with both uh, David. 
um, over at WXY Studio uh, and and John over at, at John's website and, and you can message John on Twitter at, at Moody Conan. Um, guys, thank you so much for this. Uh, it was really enlightening and, and thank you to our audience for, for hanging in there and, and enjoying this, this film with us. I'm going to bring Faye back on so we can uh, do some, some housekeeping. Uh, again, John and, and David, thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to getting together when, when we're all vaccinated and, and we, can, we can do so safely. Likewise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, we've been posting links to the classic urbanism films that uh, David and John uh, were talking about um, in the street. That one I can't wait to watch. Um, so, and then also we have urban planning films at the SF Urban Film Fest. That's right, we do. Uh, yes, we do. So coming up tonight at 5.30 p.m. is a panel discussion uh, on survival by zip code. And, this, and the discussion is around Judith Helfen's film Cooked Survival by Zip Code, which is available to rent all week long uh, using a sliding scale rental pass. Um, but then to come back to the panel, just uh, go to the live stream link uh, on the web page. Uh, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook Live tonight. Um, and also please take a moment to fill out our survey. And if you love us, um, share out our events and tag us on social media at SF Urban Film Fest. And thank you again. See you later. Thanks, everyone.